Good evening, I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Let's begin with a survey by a Singapore research centre, the Asias Yusuf Isha Institute. This survey was titled The State of Southeast Asia 2020, which found that a majority of Malaysians dis disapproved of the resettlement of displaced Rohingya people in Malaysia. Now, this is quite ironic given that Malaysian respondents were also the most dissatisfied with the way ASEAN is dealing with the Rakhine issue. Now, what do you make of this incongruity, Sharad? Well, I, you know, of course, there's a, the comparative perspective in this as well. It's not just Malaysians who were surveyed, uh, others from around the region, including Filipinos and Indonesians, who, who are apparently, at least on the, on the face of it, uh, are much more sympathetic, open to the idea of resettlement in their own countries. But I think you can't <coughs> discount, Melissa, the cost of taking on the burden of refugees and displaced people, especially ones who are traumatized. And this, um, you know, uh, humanitarian efforts are great and governments are often, uh, you know, willing to do so, but local populations do bear the cost of it in terms of uh, taxpayer money, uh, the space. Sometimes we think of, you know, how the Turkish government has allowed, you know, over two million Syrian refugees to occupy uh, parts of the country, right? right? So there, there is a pressure on local populations, there are pressures on uh, resources that might come into bear. So that might be part oh. of the reason why Malaysians might be pushing back on this. You reckon it's the cost? Now, I, I was quite surprised by this, to be honest with you. I didn't think about the cost uh, element because, again, the Malaysian government has been very has been a leading voice in support of for the Rohingyas, um, Tun Dr Mahathir last year, I believe he hit out at the lack of will by the UN and its ability, inability to intervene in the Rohingya crisis. Malaysia also gives, as you mentioned, hum humanitarian crisis, uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, we host about 100 and 150,000 uh, Rohingya refugees here. Malaysia operates that field hospital, Cox's Bazaar, um, in Bangladesh. So I'm thinking from the very top level that the government wants to help Rohingya, um, Rohingya displaced Rohingya people, but why is it that Malaysians on the ground feel like they do not want the resettlement of Rohingya people in the country, given you, that it's a Muslim majority country and these are uh, you know, Muslim Rohingya, right? Well, I mean, I think the core uh, religionist uh, angle is probably what will strike people first as a, as a reason for thinking this is in Congress. So there's mm. something odd about uh, people's attitudes considering the, the, the so-called affiliation. But I, I think it's probably deeper than that. Uh, and I think the Malaysian government in wanting to see a just uh, settlement in uh, on the Rohingya issue would uh, as much as the refugees themselves would want to return to Rakhine safe and secure with their properties right. uh, re-established and so on and so forth, their security reassured or uh, assured rather. So um, I think that I think it's a complicated thing. Well, I don't think uh, that we should necessarily run away with the idea that it's about heartlessness on the part of Malaysians okay. or, or, you know, that's, as such. That's fair. But do you think that Malaysians are perhaps more sympathetic to other refugees from other countries? I mean, uh, we, you know, we also host refugees from uh, the Palestine, uh, from Yemen, Syria. Remember Bosnia? We took in a number of uh, war refugees from Bosnia. Are we, do we hold different countries in different esteem? Well, I mean, th I think that often, Melissa, has uh, you know come up in social media, and there's, there's a bit of mockery about this, about well, you know, uh, that perhaps you know race plays a part in it. You know, uh, Bosnians being prettier than you know, uh, you know, or, or Rakhine or Rohingya, and I don't think that's necessarily true. But whatever it is, there's the idea of some sort of you know aesthetic dimension to it. I actually don't think that's what's going okay. on. When you think of what happened uh, during uh, the Bosnian crisis, the numbers I think. Of Bosnians who came here, much, much smaller. Okay. Uh, and I think uh, numbers do play a big part. Mm. And actually, when you go back to the 70s and the way Malaysia handled the Vietnamese boat people crisis, Malaysia was extraordinary uh, in many ways in extending
extending uh, support to the Vietnamese. Uh, you know, Pulau Bidong, because we had that terrible camp uh, down in, um, uh, in uh, not Sungai Bulo, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the way to uh, um, Bangi. Uh, those camps were quite bad in the sense of, you know, uh, but uh, nevertheless, Malaysia, I think, has been seen to be a country that, while it hasn't signed on to the necessary conventions uh, re regarding the rights of refugees, has actually, in practice, right. gone quite a long way. Done, done, extended a helping hand. All right, well, let's take a look at other news of the day. We have past party president, Datuk Sri Hadi Awang, today saying that the G25 was more dangerous than Al Mauna. So the G25 is a group of retired senior civil servants, which claims to be, if I may quote their Facebook page, quote unquote, committed to, a pe to pursue a peaceful, tolerant, moderate, multiracial Malaysia. Now, the Al Ma'una is an Islamic militant group that stole weapons from a military armory back in 2000. They took four hostages and killed two of them, a policeman and a soldier, before surren surrendering. Now, coming back to Hadi Awang's comment, this was what he said. We have experienced a time when Al Ma'una, a group that indulged in prayer rituals but, Isla but ignorant of Islamic jurisprudence, attacked an army camp and endangered the lives of people. This group, the G25, and its ilk are more dangerous than Al Ma'una as they are a threat to Muslim beliefs. What do you think? Well, Melissa, I mean, you know, for especially for non-Muslims like myself, but a, but a Malaysian who you know I guess shares the space with Muslims, uh, the, these kind of uh, statements are troubling. Partly because it seems to suggest, I mean, there might be a theological basis to uh, Hadi's concerns. I mean, he clearly, I mean, I don't know if he's been quoted correctly, but to the, if we accept on face value this report, uh, the idea that he's actually talking about the belief systems. That it what is it that G25 is threatening? Well, okay. So, so and I'm how gonna, is it threatening? I'm right? just going to come, come back and give a little bit of backstory. So last weekend, G25 released a report that questioned the administration of Islam in Malaysia as well as laws on apostasy. Now, um, Hadi has come out to say that the G25 poses an intellectual threat to Muslims. And I think that's an interesting that's an interesting comparison to make, the in intellectual threat versus, uh, you know, comparing it to a group that took up arms and was uh, clearly a militant group. Yeah, I mean, because the question uh, perhaps at the end of the day is most, who's most threatened by the intellectual efforts put out by G25? You know, is it the state or is it in fact competing groups that have a different visions of Malaysia and different visions of how the religion ought to be um, administered in the country, right? So that I see. So it's right. actually a threat to pass, a threat to Hadi, it's said to uh, those uh, clerics who support their version of how Malaysia should be in, re with, re in relation to the, 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 uh, the, um, the religion of Islam. Right. I do think, though, what Hadi does politically in this is very interesting because with all extremist groups, uh, I think the, dis the, the middle ground is the most dangerous. It's not the non-Muslim who's the most threatening. To, uh, to the extremists is actually moderate Muslims. It's the silent, moderate majority. And in this case, not so silent, moderate, <laughs> uh, moderate uh, Muslim. Because they create uh, a middle ground for which people can, all sides can come together. There can be some negotiation. It's based on reason. Uh, you know, these are well-researched right. uh, uh, statements that are produced in books. Yeah. All these things do not create the kind of polarizing effect that extremists in this country really want. So if you look at all the extremist groups, Ultimately, the moderate Muslim is the most uh, dangerous uh, uh, antagonist that they have. There you go. All right, well, let's round up the week, shall we, with some good news. Malaysian writer Joshua Kum has won Singapore's Epigram Books Fiction Prize, which is often referred to as Singapore's richest literary prize. Epigram is a private publishing house, so just to make that clear. Now, this is the second time that Malay a Malaysian has won the award, but at just 23 years old, Joshua is the youngest to win the 75,000 ringgit prize money. So he won for his manuscript titled, How the Man in Green Saved Pahang and Possibly the World.
Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, on so many <laughs> levels, and great that uh, you know a Malaysian has won an award and some international recognition. Elaine Chu uh, out in uh, Britain has been shortlisted for a prize that comes out of Manchester, uh, and and so on and so forth. I mean, Malaysians do well overseas, and they should be credited for it. The other thing that's quite fascinating is why Epigram, which is actually a pub. Uh, a private, a publisher. private publisher mm -hmm. uh, would uh, now open up right. the criterion to include non-Singaporeans. So previously, the Epigram Books pri uh, Prize was only restricted to Singaporean citizens, and this is, the, I think, the first time that they've opened it up to ASEAN writers. And this is quite interesting because Joshua uh, beat out a uh, Singaporean, Ernie Saleh, also a Californian Thai-based writer. Uh, we also have a, a university, Brunei Darussalam professor, who was shortlisted. So it's a truly, um, I guess, you know, o open a competition. And I'm, I'm, it made me wonder whether if this was a Malaysian book prize, whether we would also open up the submissions to international applicants or applicants from other countries to make sure that it's a truly competitive award. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's one thing about competition in this particular case, Melissa, but also I think for Epigram, it's fri about finding talent, right? So Epigram, uh, uh, very well known for publishing the graphic novel by Sunny Liu, uh, uh, you know, The Life and Times of uh, uh, Sunny, uh, Lim Hock Chai. Uh, the, 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 the idea there is that you need to get talent in order to create bestsellers mm. and you know which can sell globally right, right. so uh, why would you limit yourself to your national boundaries and to only citizens mm. especially for a city state that is uh, has a reasonably small population of right. less than 5 million people right so and singapore has a very long standing discussion it's a it's a really a debate and there are pushbacks to the government's position there on talent mm. on accepting talent globally because singapore cannot afford to just play within, within its own borders. borders. Okay, but what I'm wondering is, I've never heard of Joshua come before, but I'm wondering why he was honoured in Singapore and perhaps looked over in Malaysia. I'm not well, sure I, whether he was, but I, I had hoped to have heard about him first through a, a Malaysian award as opposed to having heard well, about it, him through a Singaporean award. Well, Melissa, it might have come about because he, you know, he had submitted this, uh, this uh, manuscript uh, for publication. So what the award does is it gives money, but it also, uh, you know, then becomes part of the publishing plan. So mm. the book is not yet published. Right. It will be published this year. So it's an that advance on the publishing, publishing right? Yeah. Okay. And so that is what I think probably it's not I'm you know, we always jump to the conclusion that perhaps, you know, people were not honored and there was some discrimination involved. It might not be that at all. It's True. just that Epigram is smart enough to say to themselves they need talent from as far as wide a catchment area as possible. They're not limiting themselves to Singaporeans. And hopefully we will adopt the same approach. Now, coming up after this on Consider This, we're going to be taking a closer look at what to expect in the final hours before the Kimanis by-election. Stay tuned.